Welcome to another episode of the Maradiya Show where we are meeting Muslims where they are. I am your host, Shadid Muhammad. Um, today's uh, discussion, inshallah ta'ala, is titled The Elephant in the Room, a community divided by ego, opinions, and cult behavior. Most of us are aware of a lot of the recent clamor and discussions that have been going on both online and offline in, in many homes, masajid, as well as in many diff, you know, dinner tables where discussions are now being redirected in terms of the stagnation of many of our communities. And when I say our communities, it's not exclusive. That's not an exclusive term when we say our communities. But my concentration is on predominantly African-American Muslim communities, mostly on the East Coast. These, a lot of these communities have uh, been riddled with cult behavior. Some of the issues you guys are more aware of than I am. Uh, imams, students of knowledge have been you know, and I'm going to use the term that is familiar to everyone, kicked off the minhaj or put off the minhaj. And I mean, just even using the term itself, it just sounds just really ignorant. Nonetheless, um, it has created, um, you know, um, a stifling mechanism in our community to the point where 20 years have gone by and we have seen very little growth in our communities, in terms of substance, in terms of, number one, the unity, the brotherhood, the sisterhood, uh, in terms of um, creating institutions, academic institutions, economic institutions, um, and we have an influx of mental health issues in our communities, we have an influx of poverty in our communities, and with all of that, um, most of those issues are usually never addressed, and the concentration is solely on who's astray, who's not astray. And so, alhamdulillah, today I have a panel of imams, students of knowledge, all of whom are graduates from one Islamic university or another. And one of the things, or two things that all of my panels, my, my, my panelists have in common is that all of them including myself at one point or another, was actually considered off of it. I don't know, I, I might still be considered off of it, and they might be too. Nonetheless, <laughs> um, that is one thing that we have all in common, is all of us are victims of, you know, this type of um, blacklisting, if you will. Not only that, all of us um, share um, a culture within the framework of Islam and that is that we're all African Americans. Which means that our concentration is usually on people that look like us, communities that we come from. And that does, here again, that's not exclusive. We're not excluding any other community. But I'm most effective, I can't speak for anyone else, but I am most effective amongst the people that look like me speak my language. There's a reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam bi lisani qawmi. He didn't say bi lughati qawmi. He didn't say in the language of his people. He said bi lisani qawmi. In the tongue of his people. Which gives a more broad meaning than just the language of his people. But the culture. He understood the culture. He understood the cultural norms of the Arabs and more specific in Mecca, because even as Arabs, they're not monolithic. They're not all one group of Arabs. They have subcultures within a mother culture. And the Prophet Sallallahu spoke to that culture, spoke to um, those cultural norms. There were actually verses from the Quran that were revealed in the Lahja, in the dialect of certain tribes to appeal to those tribes. 
There were verses from the Quran that were revealed in the dialects of certain tribes, appealing to them. So, inshallah ta'ala, our discussion tonight will be about some long overdue conversations and uh, our discussions are not going to be necessarily on the problems, but how to fix those problems so that we leave here um, after this show is over with pretty much a different paradigm, a different perspective on where should we should be headed as a community. So I would like to welcome my guests. I have Muhammad Mufti Munir, uh, who is also a graduate of the Islamic University of Medina, uh, undergraduate from the College of Hadith, graduate degree from same College of Hadith. So he has a master's degree, all right, in the sciences of Hadith. We have Imam Abu Usama, who is no stranger to our communities, who is also a graduate from the Islamic University, from the College of Dawah, the College of Dawah. And we have a third guest here today, um, who is also um, making his way into our communities, Walillahi Alhamd, uh, Ali Davis, who is also a graduate from Umm al Qura University in Mecca, from the College of Sharia, right? Islamic law, judicial law, excuse me, <laughs> judicial law, absolutely. So as you can see, uh, our panelists, our guests, um, they're no strangers to these conversations and hopefully, inshallah ta'ala, uh, the questions, um, they will do these questions some justice to help, help us begin our healing process as a community. And that is the purpose that we're here today. Today is not about bashing anyone, it's not about talking, any, talking about anyone in particular. Today is about healing and moving forward, inshallah ta'ala. So I'm going to jump in very quickly um, with um, my questions. I'm going to start with question number one, and you guys can decide who is going to tackle the question first. You guys ready? There's no backing out now. You hear. <laughs> All right, so the first question is, uh, in the midst of much confusion, many Muslims don't have a clue what a healthy, functioning Islamic community actually looks like. Please draw for our audience an image or a vision of what a healthy, functioning Islamic community looks like, so at least we have an idea of what we should be working towards. I, much as well as you brothers sitting on the stage with me have had an opportunity to live in a Muslim country that is governed by Sharia, governed by Islamic law, Quran and the Sunnah. And so we actually, could, we actually have a vision of what a functioning Islamic society does look like. Many of our audience have never lived, even if you've been to Saudi Arabia, have never lived in these countries, have never lived in these environments to actually see Islam functioning as a society. So what do we need to know living here in America, in our communities, what does a functioning Islamic, healthy Islamic community look like? Uh, you can grab that mic, whichever one you decide to go first. Paint us a picture, inshallah, of the components that comprise, that a healthy functioning Islamic community comprises of. Uh, first of all, I want to say I, um, I'm a bit, uh, not overwhelmed, but appreciative of uh, all the love that's in the room, many faces that I haven't seen in a minute, to come to this place and to hook up and to meet up with a lot of the brothers that I haven't seen is a testament to the fact that uh, the brother of Islam is still there, but irregardless of the fact that we have a lot of challenges and problems. As it relates to this question, from my perspective, I just want to make it very clear, crystal clear. The Islamic community is clearly what the Prophet brought, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I don't want to be over simplifying the situation, but it is simple. It's as simple as that in terms of the generic answer. Allah mentioned in the Quran clearly, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا You have in the Prophet ﷺ a good example, the perfect example. 
He told the people he left us the Quran and the Sunnah. Now that's just a generic answer. And I don't want to minimize the importance of it by saying it's just a generic answer. There's some application to that. And the application is, and it should be appreciated by us, that the companions of the Prophet they were just like us in terms of the environment that they lived in before he came. They had all kind of drama. People were getting high. People were highway robbers. People were making shit with a lot. People were dogging each other out. And then when the Prophet brought the message of Al-Islam, they began to build the community. So when we talk about a salafiyah, which is the truth, understanding, accepting, embracing this religion the way the companions did, may Allah be pleased with them. When we talk about that issue, we should understand that salafiyah doesn't mean that there is a utopia, that as soon as you say that word or buy into that concept, which is, which is the truth, suddenly just like that, there are no fights, there are no misunderstandings. Some of the misunderstandings that are existing between us right now happen with some of the people in the past and they were people of the Sunnah. They had drama between themselves. So my point here is, when the Prophet went to al Medina, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he really started to focus on building the community with real life people that were around him. Real life people. Not some abstract theory. Real life people. In Mecca, in Mecca, they didn't have that community as such because of the dynamics of what was going on in Mecca. But when he went to Al Medina, first thing he did was he built a base, which was the Masjid. Day. One of the first things that he did, even before getting there, was he started to build alliances. You can't live on an island by yourself. You are even going to be forced to deal with. Kuffar, the Kuffar. You're going to deal with the city hall. You're going to deal with the politicians. You're going to deal with the reality of what's going on around. So 20 years ago, there was a level of immaturity because learning is a thing, you know, it's a curve that you have to learn. You, know, you just have to let young people go through what they go through. So I remember back in the day, we came back and we were telling people, El Hijra, El Hijra, Hijra, we got a roll out of here. Yeah, but where are we rolling to? Where are we rolling to? But that's where we were at at that particular time. At that particular time. No, we have to mix with the society, with our unique, distinct personalities that our religion allows us. The demarcations of the religion are clear. And that's one of the beautiful things about a salafia, different from every other jana or idea that Muslims have is that issue of clarity, who you are and who, and, and what you are on and what you're about. And that's why we can't leave that message. We can't lose that message. So for my two cents worth as it relates to this issue, this particular question, I say that we will be doing ourselves a disservice to believe that al-Islam, which is a salafia, two synonyms, they mean the same thing, pure Islam. Al-Islam is a religion that came to a group of people just like us. And then when they accepted Al-Islam, what I mean by just like us, our issues, many of the issues that we have, many of the things that we're going to, when they became Muslims, they still had some misunderstandings. Those companions had misunderstandings between them, the best of the companions. Abu Bakr and Umar, may Allah be pleased with them. They argued, they had misunderstandings. But there are some marked contrast between them and us, obviously. They're the best nation and they are the example. So when they had that drama and they had that problem, they taught us how to deal with those issues and how to address those issues. So that's what I want to put forward, that we are not in a situation where we have to reinvent re the will. The blueprint is right there. He addressed a group of people who had issues, hey, 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 hey. In this room, I have no doubt there are some of us who has something to do with abortions in one way, shape, form, or another. Maybe you advised something in the past, Jahiliya, has something to do with an abortion. 
But is there anybody here who after the baby came out of the mother's womb, he took that baby and buried that baby in the sand because she was a girl? Is anyone here who did that? No. So that level of craziness that some of the Arabs had like that, it's a sign of indication. We got issues, but those companions as a people in that environment, they had issues as well. But when the Prophet came with the theme that he came with, they submitted, and as a result of that, they were able to establish the community. Jazakallahu khairan. Is there any of our other panelists that would like to tackle that issue? Bismillah. As-salamu wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. After praising Allah Azza wa and thanking him, I can thank you for having me on the show again. It's always a pleasure, alhamdulillah, inshallah, it's always a benefit. Um, to uh, piggyback, inshallah, and uh, uh, further uh, continue the point of Abu Usama, may Allah bless him. Amen. That's a very difficult question and a very long, drawn out answer. To summarize it in the points, I would say the ingredients of a successful community, of a thriving community, of a beaming, booming community. First and foremost, is strong Islamic knowledge. Whether that's through the Imam and the assistant, through the classes, the brothers and the sisters, everybody, there should be a strong presence of solid and sound Islamic knowledge. Whether you studied in South Africa, Medina, Mecca, Yemen, whether you're self-taught, whether you learned when you were incarcerated, it's important to sound Islamic knowledge. In my humble opinion, that's the first key ingredient. Number two, I feel that the successful community has to have uh, business-minded people. People who are business-minded. People who know how to make money. Even if they don't have money themselves, but they know how to make money. Movers and shakers. You have to have movers and shakers. And as Abu Osama mentioned, which is you know, more than enough for the entire show, what worked for them can work for us. The blueprint does not to be remade. Uh, there were some things that the companions uh, the issues and problems that they had that are unheard of, like burying a baby girl alive in the sand. It's unheard of. Even with the worst and most savage abortion, it's not after birth, burying it in the sand just because it's a girl. And there are other problems that we suffer as Americans, or as black Americans, whatever the case may be, that were unheard of to the Arabs. All right? However, the blueprint is one. Uh, the Prophet said, of course, that blueprint, there would be no da'wah, there would be no hijrah without Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, where did the camels come from? Abu Bakr, his bank, his purse. The Prophet says, he says, no one has a, a bigger favor over me. I'm not indebted to someone more than Abu Bakr Siddiq because of his wealth. Who are the people who supported and funded the armies? Who are the people who took care and built the bricks and the stones? They were the bankers of the Sahaba. So a community that doesn't have money, that doesn't have the ability to raise money, to get money, is going to starve. And it's not just enough, in my humble opinion, to beg for money on Friday. It helps out, people give, but I don't think that's enough. And if it's enough to establish a building or a rehabilitated house into a masjid or a masala or a storefront, it isn't enough to take it to the next level. And we can clearly see that. It was good in 96, 97, 98, 89, 75, 2017. No. It's not enough to harass and say, give your sadaqah, give your sadaqah. That's good just to keep the masjid running. The wudu station, the bills, the imam who's underpaid. Huh? Overworked? <laughs> no doubt, it's a reality. When you talking about making a legacy and making a, the, you know, you say, taking it to the next level, it's gonna be some, some real economic plans that are needed. So people that are professionals, in any level of professionalism, street professionalism and white college professionalism, and both are needed. It's not just enough to have a degree in economics and finance from a school or a college. You need people that are hustlers, that are bustlers, people that know how to raise money. That's very important. Number three, I think that it has to be a strong presence of muscle in the community. You need tough guys, and you need tough sisters as well. The man has to feel safe. The sister has to feel safe to walk to the masjid in the daytime or at night. The people have to feel safe, the children have to feel safe walking to the corner store and no one's gonna bother them. And if they aren't safe and if they're afraid, someone's gonna throw a brick into the masjid window or do this, and the people, they're not gonna truly develop. And that's why there's no country that produces and creates and innovates in the field of science and medicine and this and that unless it has a strong military presence. The people, the scientists, the engineers, the chemists, the doctors, the writers, the poets, they have to be safe. And this is also manifested in the blueprint of the Prophet, so as Abu Salaam mentioned. Who were those tough guys? Who were those people that were the muscle? Umar al-Khattab. They were the, the Sahaba that protected them and made them strong. Hamza, 
in which when they became Muslim, the Muslims had a sense of pride. They weren't afraid because if you bother this poor weak Muslim, Abdullah Mas'ud Radhiallahu is very skinny. He climbed the tree, and some of the companions laughed at him how skinny he was. This is the Sahaba, and the Prophet says, "Do you know how heavy the, his, he'll be in a scale on Yom Qiyamah?" So if they bothered the skinny, scrawny companion, they had to deal with the big, brolic companion. So I think it's a very important key element and not just disorganized, tough guys, but an actual professional security team for the masjid. Now, I don't want to go too deep and open up no old wounds, and we don't want nobody saying this and that, but it is a reality. In the early days, in the 60s, the 50s, the 40s, the different movements of Islam. All right, we don't want to mention the names, the different movements of Islam. But one of the key factors of this movement of Islam was security. Security force. They and, had, and, and many of you here used to be part of those security. No <laughs> Quiet as kept. <laughs> no doubt. That is a reality. Yes. It's a reality. After that, a key ingredient is that the people, and perhaps I'll, I'll end with this one point, maybe Abu Zainab wishes to say something. I would say is the people that are running the community with the Imam, the administration, the Mu'addin, the teacher, the security guard, they have to be people that are running their lives properly. Wow. That are responsible parents, fathers, mothers, Allah adults, Allah. and not people that have broken themselves. Now, this is probably one of the biggest plagues that we have. Somebody's in charge, and as it says in Surah Yusuf, nafsi, I don't free myself from this. A person is a leader who really needs to be led himself. Hmm. Someone's in charge, he has to do something, and he, not everybody has problems. We all have issues, all of us. But it's Speaking about myself, we have major issues in our households that we aren't doing properly. And I'm on the memoir saying, Ittaqullah, take care of your family. Men are protectors and maintainers of women. My sister, my mother, my daughter, no hijab. Okay? Now, you talk about, I remember a couple years back, first time you saw me wear this, right? You said, What is this? <laughs> right? This is a true story. So I said to him, He has an eye for fashion, though. Make no mistake about that. I said to you, just as quick, I said, It's no different than what you got on, right? <laughs> so obviously, they said, Okay, Muhammad, Mufti, whatever you call him, he's crazy. He does a chuppah with a sword, he has a loose outfit. <laughs> Osama, he said we were in Canada last December. He says you had on the 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 gun and tie chi jacket, so and so. so I'm, I'm trying to make a point. I'm trying to make a point. My friends, close friends, they know I was raised and I love martial arts. I'm trying to make a point here. There's some martial arts in the Far East, specifically in Japan, in which a person is not allowed to take on students. He's not allowed to train. He's not allowed to make a dojo until he reaches the age, a very interesting age, of 40. Wow. He's not allowed to be a master until he at least reaches the age of 40. And then he's given the title of Hanshi. And a Hanshi, they say, is someone who has mastered himself. Mm. Then he goes on to master somebody else. So maybe the imam of a community, a leader of a community, a financer of a community, my bills are way behind. My house is falling apart. My wife is, and my kids in this school, and it's a problem. So the leadership itself can't be full of gaping holes. We can't lead others, and we haven't led ourselves. So I think it's a crucially important point that is often neglected, is that the people that are running the masjid, the imam, the administration, do not put people in charge that are not good managers of their own homes and businesses. And we tend to, and we tend to, to that point, we tend to look at how knowledgeable a person is or how affiliated they are or aligned with a particular interpretation of Islam and then we'll use that as the criteria for selecting this person to be the Imam and we totally overlook his social affairs we totally overlook the mo his morality, his muru'a his level of moral integrity and we'll totally toss that out of the window and concentrate on the fact, well, he's knowledgeable, or he's Salafi, or he's affiliated with this group, and we'll use that as the criterion and totally forget about everything else. And then when we're knee-deep in sin as a community, because when a person is engaging in a the behavior, they can't talk about it. I remember there was a particular sheikh from Medina, without mentioning any names, and we were doing a telelink with him. And we asked him to give a talk about zakat. 
And the sheikh said, I just bought a Suburban, cash, for 100,000 reals or something like that. He was like, there's no way that I can give a talk about Zakat. He said, choose another topic, I'll talk about it. I feel uncomfortable. I just spent all of this cash on a truck. And I'm going to get up in front of you guys and give a talk about giving money for Zakat? He said, I, I feel uncomfortable. Choose another topic and I'll talk about it. So my, the point that I'm making is that when you select someone to be an imam or we hire someone to be an imam that does not have his social morals in place, um, they're going to do the community a disservice because they're going to sidestep, yet the agenda. They're going to stay away from those moral issues because they are falling into them. So they can't address them. And so this is why you have a lot of leadership that will sidestep issues of morality like domestic violence, issues of you know, fornication and adultery. When was the last time you heard a khutbah about the dangers of adultery or fornication? And it's rampant in our communities. It's the elephant in the room. But you can't talk about something and you've fallen into it. So to that point, man, alhamdulillah, some, some very, you know, and I hope you guys are taking notes this is not just about here airing out our dirty laundry. This is here. We're here to create a blueprint that will work for us, taken from the original blueprint of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I don't know, Brother Ali, if you wanted to. Bismillah wa salatu wa salam wa rasulillah. It's kind of hard to add something to what Sheikh Abu Samah said and the Mufti and Shadid. Um, just to add a little bit to it, I was just telling um, Sheikh Abu Samah. We ran into each other, I think it was 08. In 2008, we made Hajj together. And when I ran into him, we got into a long discussion. And I said, Sheikh, when you gonna come back to America? And he said, when you graduate and come back, I'll be back. So before the show started, the first thing I said to him, well, I'm back now, so what are you gonna do? <laughs> that was that. Um, <laughs> so with regards to the, the issues that we're talking about with the communities, the number one thing that I, I stress with myself and everyone else is accountability. The problem is we don't have no accountability in our communities. And for that reason, it's like a cat chasing his tail. We'll never catch up because no one is holding anyone else accountable. In our communities and you know, religious leaders or what have you, or if you're affiliated with certain religious leaders, you can do and say whatever you want. There's no repercussion. People are afraid and those days have to end. Uh, the issue is, like, like Brother Shadid mentioned, we spent a lot of years living in the Muslim countries. And one of the things that I noticed is that in the Muslim countries, people are allowed to be lay people. Everyone is not going to be a student of knowledge. We have people in the communities that go to work, take care of their families. They're not, you don't have to memorize a certain amount of hadith and memorize the entire Quran to be Muslim. It's enough to learn what is necessary and incumbent for you to enter into paradise. That's it. Everyone's not going to be a student of knowledge. But we need doctors. We need people that can protect us, lawyers. We need everyone from every gamut to help the community, help the community grow. In addition to that, we also need, like the Brother Mufti mentioned, we need to be able to establish our own funds. Asking people for money all of the time is not the answer. So in Philly right now, we're starting another community, Mufti, myself, and Abu Sajid, wherever he is, if he's in here, um, it's called Imam Muslim Family Center. And the reason why we're putting this together is because we recognize these issues. Among ourselves, I've known Mufti for many years. Abu Sajid, I've known him since before I was even Muslim. And we hold each other accountable. If anyone's out of pocket as a term that we use, everyone's going to get it. No one's above the law. And this is a term that I always use. The law here is the Quran and the Sunnah. No one is above that. No student of knowledge, no scholar, no one is above the Quran and the Sunnah. And what that means is anyone can be questioned if, they go, if they're in opposition to the book and the Sunnah. It doesn't matter who they are, what status you hold, it doesn't matter. Obviously, if it's a person that's on a scholarly level, they're going to approach him with a little more respect and a lot more dignity, perhaps, than you would if you were talking to someone on your own level or perhaps they didn't have as much knowledge as you. But at any event, no one, uh, no one is above the law. And I think that's very important, especially in our communities 
because we have, unfortunately, we have in our communities this, uh, this groupy, starstruck mentality when it comes to students and knowledge and scholars, or et cetera. And the reason why I'm saying that is because years ago, Sheikh Abu Hussein, he was on top, and I was one of the young people in the crowd listening to him give lectures. This is before I even thought about studying Islam. And I used to look at the, the way people looked at them, and I said to myself, I didn't want to be put in that position, but I wanted to learn Islam. So you got to understand as young people, listening to brothers like Abu Sama throughout the years, and one minute he's on top, and the next minute they throw him down to the ground, and you're wondering, you're left questioning yourself, well, what happened? What did he do wrong? Well, how did that happen? How did this? And so you get scared. And then you say, you know what, I don't want to study Islam. Then you say, okay, I do want to study Islam, but I don't want to be in that position. I'm pretty sure every brother here on this stage, there was a time when you said, man, I'm, I'm just going to do everything I have to do and not get warned against. Right or wrong? Everyone. Everyone. So some, at one point in time, you know, I'm just going to walk the, the straight path. And, you know, if I, maybe these brothers are warned against because they really are deviants. This is what you start to believe. Well, maybe they really are deviants. So I'm just not going to do what they do. And then you reach a point when you study Islam and you say, you know what? The truth is here and other than that is here. And the choice is yours. What do you want to do? And so for people in our position, you have an option. Either stand on what you believe to be correct or follow the crowd even though you know it's wrong and you don't believe it. So my question to the brothers and the other students that chose the other path, how do you sleep at night? How do you sleep at night? And one thing I can say about every brother on this stage right now, I believe every one of us here in Charlotte, Tyler, can sleep at night and not believe that we did something that we didn't believe. So having said all of that, in order to establish a community, men have to be men. It starts with the men. Men have to be men. As we say, it's time to man up. And the men got to really man up. And, and, for the, and for those of you who were listening to the khutbah today, that's exactly what the khutbah was about. SubhanAllah I had no idea he was going to say what he said. I had no idea. Not to cut you off, Shane. I'm sorry about that. All right, so stay right there because my next question is, uh, you know, I kind of let you guys slide on that one. Next question is going to get you in your feelings. Okay, so question number two is that we notice a trend dating back to the mid to late 1990s that many scholars in Saudi Arabia answer general questions that specifically target individuals in the Muslim community and more specific the African American Muslim community for reasons that has led to much of the fragmentation and division of our communities. How and why did this trend start? And moving forward, how do we cushion the community from being divided even further as a result of these general warnings or statements? And should these statements cause people to look at the scholars differently? So that's a four part question. Number one, how did this trend start of going back to Saudi Arabia to ask a particular scholar about this imam or this person? We all know the, the uslu, the, 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 the chain of, or the pattern of how these questions go. Ya Sheikh, barakallahu feek. There's a brother in our community in America who says this, this, this. What do you say about him? The Sheikh said, who a jahil, who a ajhar, ajhal min himari ahli, who a kada, who a kada, who a kada. And that person records that comment, comes back to America, translates it in English, and then specifically targets this imam or that imam. That's how it goes. That's how the game is played. Been played like that since Abu Muslima was the Imam. And from, I took my Shahada in 1998. When I stepped foot into Masjid Ahlus Sunnah, because I'm from East Orange. So that was the place that I was going to go to. Not necessarily because of Abu Muslima, but because that's just where I'm from. And that was the place to be at that time. When I stepped, from the moment I stepped into that community, Whispers will already begin to spread. Sheikh will be a warned against this one, warned against that one, or whatever the case may be. And I was, that was my introduction to this trend that has continued all the way until it has impacted me. Now, think about that for a second. 
I came into Islam in 1998, 1999, I stepped foot in Masjid Ahlul Sunnah. Sheikh Rabia warned against this one or this one, or this Sheikh warned against this one or that one. And I'm hearing this as a new convert to Islam. Fast forward 10, 15 years later, I'm a victim of the same trend. I'm a victim of the same trend. How did that start? Why did it start? And how do we cushion our communities for these comments, these warnings to continue fragmenting us? And should these warnings cause us to look at these scholars differently? And I'll start with Abu Usama since he's the elder from amongst us and he's been around longer than all of us. And he knows more about this trend and where it started and why more than probably anyone here. In actuality, historically, this problem goes back way before we were even born and we were Muslims. This is an old issue that Muslims have done, Muslims who have diseases in their hearts. So the Salaf came up with this concept. I think it's really important that you guys leave this place understanding this. They said, like, our brother is Mufti, Mufti, Munir, Mufti, Meek. So you know that word. They say, al-mufti asir al-mustafti. The one who's given the fatwa is the captive of the one who's asking the question. Meaning if I come with a question, it could be loaded. I want to use it against my wife. I want to use it against my adversary. It may be loaded. Or it's a sincere question and the sheikh has to answer based upon what I'm saying. So if I say to the Sheikh, hey Sheikh, there is a brother who talks bad about Abu Bakr and Umar, radiallahu anhuma. What do you have to say about that? What else is the Sheikh going to say other than that person who's talking bad about Abu Bakr and Umar, you have to check his head, you have to check his iman. What's wrong with that guy? So I ran back and I said, Sheikh so and so said, this guy is crazy, you gotta get his head checked. <laughs> Because the sheikh is going to answer based upon what he's given. So he's not blameworthy necessarily in those cases. But the point is, this issue goes back way before we were even Muslims. It's an old school move that people used to use a long time ago to get their opponent. Another issue that I wanted to mention, and I think this is really critical, because it's from the angle of what the Prophet told us to do, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, if Allah bestowed a ni'mah upon you. He said, At-tahaddufu bi ni'matillahi shukruha. If you talk about the ni'mah that Allah bestowed you upon you, it's a form of giving thanks. Wa amma bi ni'mati rabbika fahaddith. Talk and tell the people about the name of Allah. The people you love, obviously. So you don't get the evil eye, you don't get haters. But one of the ni'mahs that Allah bestowed upon me is, when I was in Medina in the mid late 80s, the doors of Sadafiya opened to me from Asham, and Al Albani was there. So it was his dawah that, for me, I gravitated more to, to, than anyone else. Than anyone else. So as a result of that, you'll find that sheikhs like Al Albani, and they were around when all this drama was happening. People used to call them. It's on YouTube, you can find it. Sheikh, there's a person who says this, is, the Sheikh will say, who are you? Who are you? Ah, do I know you? And do you know who knows me? Do I know you? And he would do that. And he would try to get the guy off of that thing he's asking about this and that. The Sheikh could smell something is fishy here. Ibn Baz, Ibn Ufaymin, those ulama, rahmatullahi alayhi, those people during my time. They had a different awareness than what we find now. Now, some of the shiuk are blameworthy. And that's the elephant in the room. We gotta call it how it is. Where the sheikh is saying to people, if you don't say something about this, I'm gonna bring you down. You understand? I'm gonna bring you down if you don't do that. So what happens now is, the sheikh, he doesn't ask. And in the climate that we're dealing with, the climate all over the world, even places where the Muslims had armed conflict in Libya, in El Iraq, in Syria. Salafiyah is there. So when the Sheikh gives a fatwa there, it's not just boycotting people and character assassination. 
This is somebody coming up with an AK and blasting people now. And the shaykh is talking, and that stuff is happening in the Muslim world. And that stuff is happening in the Muslim world. And the shaykh is still saying things that is potentially inflammatory, deadly even. So what we have to do is understand this is not a new thing. This thing goes back a long, long time ago. But now we do have to look back and we say, some of the ulama of Islam, they're not blameworthy at all because he is the captive of the one who's asking the question and he answers the question just based upon what's being asked. But then there are some people who have a vested interest to be raised up, propped up, to be looked at as the don. There's just no other way of putting it. The chef just wants to be the boss. And some of us, we had enough sense that we never, ever, ever, ever drink the Kool-Aid. Not one day, not one time. Some of us, and those of us who did drink the Kool-Aid, no problem, how do you not? We're happy that our brothers came back because we all make mistakes one way or another. So that's my two cents as it relates to this issue. And a lot more can be said, and I'm sure that the brothers are going to say those things. <laughs> Mufti's wheels are spinning, so I'm hoping we get a, a, a very detailed answer. Brother Ali. Imam Ali. So the, the question is, um, how did this trend start? And obviously each uh, speaker will speak from his own perspective in terms of how he was introduced to this particular trend. Um, why is, was it necessary? And how do we cushion our communities moving forward from these types of warnings and statements um, that are being translated and pushed back out into our communities, how do we cushion the community from being further fragmented? And should this cause um, the Muslims to look at some of these scholars in a different light? It's a heavy question. It's heavy. Um, first, it's in terms of the history, <clears throat> I don't know, I can't say, I, I don't go that far back to say, okay, where the history started. However, uh, what I believe, and Allah knows best, is that the issue starts with a lack of knowledge. A lack of knowledge of the one that's asking the question. And so, I remember, I remember uh, one day we were with uh, one of the Mashaikh in Mecca, and he said to me, if you just wanted to be a translator, then you shouldn't have came here to study at Umar Quarter. He should have went to Egypt, and this is no disrespect to brothers that go there, but he meant Egypt in terms because they have Arabic centers. Just go there and study Arabic and go back to your country and be a translator. He said, if you want to study knowledge, then you need to sit here and do your own research. So one of the issues that I find is that when you ask a scholar a question, the scholar is going to look at the questioner. Who is he? For example, if a brother is considered a student of knowledge, you're not going to ask a scholar, what's the position on a brother who says this? A student of knowledge is not going to ask that question. Understand that, brothers and sisters. A talib will not ask a question like that. That student of knowledge will do his due diligence. He will research the issue, find out the statements of the salaf, and come up with his own opinion, and then ask a scholar about that. In other words, Sheikh, this is my research, this is what I came up with. What do you think about that? And if that scholar says, no, that's not correct, he has enough courage in himself to ask, well, why do you oppose that? I believe this to be correct. If you say this is not correct, what's your evidence to support it? These are the conversations that we used to have with the ulama. These are the conversations that we would have. So having said that, when a student of knowledge or a person that is a questioner, they call overseas and ask questions, the scholar automatically assumes that this person doesn't know anything because he didn't bring anything. The only thing he brought was a statement from someone else, and so they're going to treat you like that, like you know any, like you don't know anything. So when they give you a ruling based on a person, they're treating you as if you know nothing about Islam at all. That's number one. That's one aspect. With regards to, okay, so how do we move forward from that? One of the ways is holding people accountable. Holding those who questioned the scholars, who said to the, hold them accountable. When you hear a verdict back, hold the scholars accountable. Everyone has to be accountable. There was a situation in Germantown, Michigan, years ago. 
A particular scholar got involved and he made statements about it. I went to his house after Fudger. I swear by Allah, I went to his house after Fudger and waited for him to come out. Sheikh, why did you say X, Y, Z? It wasn't in a disrespectful way. But we need to know these are our communities. This is where we come from. Why did you say X, Y, Z? He gave his reason. I may disagree with him, but at the end of the day, I had the, I had the courage to ask him. I wasn't afraid to ask the questions that need to be asked. The thing is this, when they see that you have that ability to ask them questions, to hold them accountable, they're gonna look at you totally different. And they're, they're gonna, gonna, and they're gonna respond differently. And they're gonna respond, absolutely. They're gonna respond totally differently based on the questioner and what you're asking. The next issue, should we look at them in general in a bad light? I'm gonna say no. Why? Because at the end of the day, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raised the level of the earth man. They're still scholars of other Islam, but they are human beings. And human beings are prone to error. Every human. Will they say some things that you disagree with that may be incorrect? Absolutely. Because if they didn't, that would take away from them being human beings. Uh, but Ali, let me interject here because mm. even though you say that, um, just playing the devil's advocate, one would say, well, who are you to say that this shape made a mistake? So that, that's usually how people are bullied. When you say, I don't necessarily accept what that shape is saying, and then the response to that is, well, do you know more than the shape? Or the shape knows him better than you. That is usually the response. So how do you respond? To, how does anyone in this crowd, when they are confronted with this, how do they respond to that? So firstly, in, in that situation that you mentioned, if a person says to you, well, you know, do you know more than the shake? I only can say what I say based on what the shake said and the evidence that he presented. If you remember what I mentioned earlier, our religion has rules and regulations. Just like with any job and any facet of life that you embark upon, there are rules. For example, if a person works on a job, you can't be held accountable for that job until you understand what's required of you and the rules and regulations of that job. If a person wants to get a driver's license, they have to read a manual and understand the rules and regulations of associated with driving a vehicle. The same thing applies to a slam. If a scholar is going to give a verdict on something or someone, there are rules to the game. If you don't know the rules of the game, then obviously you're a person that can't speak. But if you're talking about a person that studied Islam, you can't just tell me, for example, he's an innovator. There's rules to that. Well, what innovation did he do? He did a what? Well, who said that was innovation? Show me, because all of this stuff is documented information. Absolutely. Brothers and sisters in Islam, our religion is perfect. There's no crookedness in our deen. If a scholar says a man's an innovator, then you should be able to find out what the innovation is. It's simple as that. If you say that he's an innovation because, he's an innovator because uh, he prayed with his hands to the side. We need some documented evidence to support it. This is the problem with our community. We're afraid to ask questions. So when you ask questions, every once, once people get to the point where they're not afraid, and you can honestly say, you know what? This doesn't make sense to me. Shake, explain it to me. I don't want to be, I don't want to be a mule and just follow. I want to understand. At the end of the day, I want to have whatever you have. So if you're going to tell me this brother's an innovator, I need to know why. What is the innovation? And, it, and the thing is, if you're given an answer, which nine times out of ten you won't, and this is calling about the people that we deal with in our communities, if they give you an answer to say this is his innovation, <clears throat> So what you should be able to do is look that thing up and figure out what innovation is it. Innovation has types. You have innovation that will take you outside the folds of Al-Islam, and you have innovation that a person will just be considered a sinful Muslim. So you ask, well, if he's an innovator, which type of innovation is it? Is it the type that we're removing from Islam, or he's just a sinner? If he's a sinner, what type of sin did he commit? When people get to the point, the average person, the average Muslim, when you get to the point where you can ask those questions, that's when the problems will stop. When you start holding everyone accountable, that's when the problems will stop, and Allah knows best. That's very, very profound. Because usually what happens is that people on your Facebook page, someone will say, they'll, what they'll do is they'll take the link from a Facebook refutation, and then they'll post it on your page and say, well, he's been warned against. And then usually what people will do is look at that link and say, okay, he's been warned against. And that's it. You never even clicked on the link. 
You never even listened to what the person said. You never looked for the delete. You never did any of that. They posted the link on your Facebook page. He's been warned against. Okay, khalas, he's been warned against. And then what you do is you share that link with somebody else. You never even listen to it. Allahu Akbar. You never even listen to it. And then you post the link to somebody else's page. Here, this is what the Sheikh said about him. He's been warned against. And you never even listen to it. And then the person never listens to it. And then this is how it spreads in the community. And then you have one brave soul who actually clicks on the link, listens to it, and said, this is bogus. This is bull crap. And then this is where the tafarruq comes in. Because now it's like, okay, you're going against the sheikh. The sheikh provided you with the delil. You're saying, what delil? It was a two, it was a one minute and 40 second clip of the sheikh saying this person is an innovator, is a deviant, stay away from him. She never quoted any delil from the Quran or the Sunnah, never mentioned the actual innovation, nothing. And for some of us, that's enough. We don't need to hear anymore. And this is, has fragmented and divided our communities on levels that is beyond what is imaginable. And we wonder why people, Muslims from other communities, other ethnic communities, backgrounds, don't even recur return the salams when we give them to them. When we give them to them. They don't even take us serious. We are the only group of Muslims in America that has allowed this foolishness, this ignorance to divide us and separate us all the way down to husband and wife. <coughs> no other community in America or any other place has allowed this dynamic to penetrate all the way down to the marriages. Brothers and sisters have divorced because she wants to listen to this imam and he says the next time I hear you listening to him, I'm going to divorce you. I mentioned this last night. Wallah al I had a sister tell me last night the same thing was done to me. I was divorced for listening to you. What other Muslim group in this country has allowed this level of ignorance to penetrate all the way down to the social fabric that is the building blocks of the community? Husband and wife separating communities, separating families. And as Imam Ali mentioned, the moment we start questioning things, because when you engage someone, you say, well, what's the shape of the little? Come on, you know, you know why well, you got to ask me for the little? You, you know, they'll, they'll take you halfway around the world. It's well known. The shape knows him, right? You get all of these general responses. Don't be a moving target. No, 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 no. Stay right here. Give me the delil. What's his innovation? Oh, he spoke about the scholars. So speaking about, okay, what was his statement? I, I didn't hear it. I, somebody told me. It's like, come on, man. Go figure your story out. Go get your story straight first. Then come back and talk to me. When you start showing that you have some level of intellect, you will begin to now back people away from you. So with that being said, inshallah, I'll allow um, Brother Muhammad Munir, inshallah, Tyler, to respond. Um, I would say, no doubt, a very long... Uh, extensive answer could be given, but to keep things brief, uh, Ali, he mentioned accountability. Um, but uh, Abu Usama, Abu Zubair, um, and uh, Abu Zainab, they just mentioned accountability in general. Now I'm gonna finally tune the term or the concept of accountability. My humble opinion, the accountability cannot be aimed at one direction. It can't just be one direction, one party, one class of accountability. I feel that the accountability has to be divided three times or spread out of three classes of people. Accountability of the scholar, accountability of the da'iyah, the da'i, the da'i, the student of knowledge, the imam, the imam, he has to be accountable, the translator, and the layman nine to five Muslim, you, not all of you, but in general, you're accountable as well. And it's not just the fault of the scholar. 
Can't just blame it on the Sheikh. The Sheikh is evil. The Sheikh has destroyed our community. The Sheikh, the Sheikh, the Sheikh, the Sheikh, he has brought no good to our community. Perhaps. But there's accountability for you. You didn't memorize Sayyid Bukhari. You didn't study in Yemen. You didn't go to Egypt. But you do have a brain. Allah gave you basic common sense, which is a genius in work clothes, as they say. A genius in work clothes is common sense, good, solid common sense. And the student of knowledge and the translator also has accountability. Some people say it's the Sheikh's words. Okay, they are, but you translated it. Everybody understand this? The Sheikh said it. I'm just giving you what the scholar says, but you're accountable. You're held responsible for the validity of your translation, for translating everything that he said, and for also giving the Sheikh valid, accurate information. When all three tiers are in cohesive movement, they be the night ta'ala, the system is going to be thorough. Everyone is accountable. What the Sheikh says, how it's presented to the people, and how you respond. If you allow a man, and this is, once again, this is no disrespect to anybody, but this is the truth. If you allow a man, if I ask you a question, hypothetically, Sheikh Fulan, and I'm not talking about one scholar, if you think it's talking about one scholar, then should put on the shoe if you feel that it fits. What does Sheikh Fulan look like? If I ask many of you, some of you made Umrah, but what does he look like? You wouldn't have a clue. If the Sheikh walked in the door and walked by, you think it's some old man, you wouldn't have a clue what he looks like. What's his kunya? What does he, what he specialize? You don't know anything about this Sheikh. And you allow him to dictate to become a dictator and to control and rule your community and separate and split up and divide and destroy and demolish, that's your fault. That's your fault. And you can't blame that on a shake. Everybody understand this? A student of knowledge who's just a donkey, an ass, that carries around books. The shake said, this one said, I translated without using his mind and the basic skills the law gave him. That's his fault. And the scholar who allows people to manipulate him and to use him as a weapon against their enemies, their opponents, their adversaries, that's his fault for allowing himself to be manipulated and to be used. Everybody's accountable and everyone's going to be held responsible on the day of judgment. So that's first and foremost. Accountability is not just for a scholar. It's your fault too. It's your fault. It's your fault, sister. It's your fault for allowing it to happen and allowing it to take place again and again and again and again. It can't be an accident. It's impossible for 20 years to go by and the same thing to just be an accident. It's a program, it's a system, but you allowed it. You allowed it. The student of knowledge and the scholar, everyone's accountable. That's first and foremost. Now, not to take too much time up. Uh, no, continue. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Let's make a few examples in show. Allah says in the Quran of Kareem, in the 10th chapter, in the tenth chapter Surah Yunus, and towards the end of the Surah, Allah says, indeed, for sure, the awliya, this word says, awliya, pro of wali, and we'll translate what that means later on and interpret it. The walis of Allah will have no fear and no sadness and no grief whatsoever. Who are the walis of Allah? As, as if someone asked the question, Allah says, Alladina amanu, those who used to believe, wa kanu yattaqoon, and they had taqwa. Allah then says in the next ayah, Lahumul bushra fil hayati dunya wa fil akhirah. For theirs is glad tidings in this life and in the hereafter. La tabadila li kalimatillah. No one can change what Allah has said. Thalika huwa al fawzul azim. Allah says, indeed, that is the great success. In the well known hadith, you all know, it says, that Allah Azza wa Jal said, "Man adali waliyan fakad adantuhu bil harb." Anyone who abuses, who annoys, anyone who aggravates, anyone who disrespects one of my walis, I have announced warfare. A state of war exists between Allah and between His person who is disrespecting one of Allah's walis. And there are other ayat and other hadith about the walis of Allah. So who is the wali of Allah? The wali of Allah has many meanings. From its meanings is a friend. A close friend, someone who is loved, someone who's protected, someone who's looked after, or looked, he's going to look after this person, an ally. So the Quran tells us that the friends of Allah, the protected slaves of Allah, the chosen slaves of Allah, won't have any worries in this life or thereafter, period. So the wali in Islam has a tremendous status according to the kitab and the sunnah. 
Now, what's the first book that you studied when you accepted Islam? What's the first book that you studied when you learned about Salafi Dawah, a Dawah to Salafi? Back in the mid-90s, late-90s, it was a Dawah to Salafi. Now it's just Salafi. Back then it was Salafi Dawah. The first book you studied, perhaps it was Surah Thalatha, Three Fundamental Principles of Islam. The first book you studied, Kitab Tawheed, Aqidah Wasatiyah, so on and so forth. Who wrote these books? Who's the author of Ibn Abdul Wahab? Who's, who's, who's the author? Ibn Abdul Wahab, correct? Ibn Abdul Wahab, Rahimahullah. Many people that he lived with, many chieftains, many people of Arabia, their major problem, they had many, was the concept of the wali. The wali. And they said about Ibn Abdul Wahab is that he's disrespecting the walis. He's reviling the walis. He's going against the walis. These awliya, these friends of Allah, they have no status to this man, Muhammad Ibn Abdul Wahab. You can't visit their graves, you can't kiss the walls of their graves, you can't swear by them, you can't slaughter for them, you can't make tawaf around their graves, you can't ask them for help, you can't wear a necklace with their names. He's disrespecting the walis of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Any Muslim will say, ah, a'udhu billah, who would disrespect one of the awliya of Allah? La khawfan alayhim wa lahum yahzanun. Who's going to disrespect Allah's wali? So Ibn Abdul Wahhab, the author of many books that you studied and memorized, he, what did he say? He says, I never disrespected a wali. He says, and I never said that the walis don't have a status. And I never said that they aren't special and protected Muslims. What I said was, is they are not equal with Allah. They're not similar to Allah. You cannot slaughter in their name. You cannot make tawaf around their graves. You cannot kiss the walls of their graves. Allah has a status like no other. And beneath that status is the status of the wali. For you to take an orange and an apple and mix them together, that's what my dawah is against. So anyone who says that Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab says disrespect the walis has lied upon Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab. And the proof is my books. Read my books to find what I believe about the walis. You wish to make shirk with this wali. You wish to take this wali as a rival with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is something that I am against. One of the main problems is not the concept of wali or shirk, we're not talking about it right now. Is to take the status of a scholar that Allah gave him and that a messenger gave them and to make that status above and beyond what Allah and his messenger gave them. That is a huge problem. This is a scholar. He is to be respected. No doubt about that. This is a scholar. You are to ask him if you don't know, as the Quran says. This is a scholar. You benefit from him. You have good thoughts for him. You make an excuse for him. Last shaykh. No doubt about that. As far as you giving the scholar the power and the ability that Allah and His Messenger did not give him, or you mixing and jumbling the right of a scholar with the right of this one and that one and the leader, then that's where the flaw comes. So the brother, the student knowledge, who goes overseas and he says, I'm not disrespecting Sheikh Fulan, I'm not disrespecting him, but I just disagree. And I sat in the classes with Sheikh Fulan and what she said, Ibn Qayyim, this one, that one, that one, if they're wrong, go against them. And that's the true way of the Salaf Salih. Imam Malik said, everyone will be refuted, his statement will be accepted, except for the one in his grave. And he pointed to the Prophet Muhammad's noble grave. That's what Imam Malik said. So this is what these scholars taught us. Not to be a donkey and an ass. Use your brain, O student of knowledge. So if I differ with this Sheikh, and I feel that he's right and the Sheikh is wrong, it doesn't mean that I disrespected this scholar. It does not mean that I have no love for the scholars. But it means loving a scholar and following the truth are two different things. Respecting a scholar is in following the teachings of that scholar. And the scholar's teachings are to go back to your country, teach your people. Don't follow anyone if they say something which is wrong. So you are mixing and matching things that don't belong, just like the people did with Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab. To slaughter in the name of Allah than Allah is shirk akbar. To love the wali and say, may Allah have mercy upon me, peace with him, that's from Iman and that's from Tawheed. Don't mix the two. You can visit the graves, say, make dua for the people in the graves, don't call upon them. So that's a major problem and a major issue. The next point we then I talk before we start is with regards to the students of knowledge, quote unquote, or the daddies or the translators. The best way to summarize it in Allah Alam, because it's a very long, extensive issue, is that all those who have power fear to lose it. Mm. All those who have power, they're afraid of losing that power. Now, like you said, Abu Sama, Abu Zaina, rock star, right? Superstar. I'm a student of knowledge. Regardless of what I studied or what I didn't study, did I graduate or not, but I'm the clearest student of knowledge. I can marry any sister that I want to. 
I can have literally a revolving door of four wives, literally at my leisure. This sister, that sister, this sister, I want a younger one, an older one, a light skin one, a dark skin one, a thin one, a thick one, anyone. This is, no, this is what happened. This is not a joke, this is real. Real talk. This is real. Real talk. Money, I want to go make Umrah, my Umrah ticket is paid for. I want a house, I want a car, I want this, I want that, food, fruit, tea, whatever you want. The fumble. Now, before I accepted Islam, not everybody, but many of us, we were nothing. Basically, a nobody. I come to Islam, I'm overseas, I graduated from a school, I'm a superstar, I'm a celebrity. Wherever I go, people know me. They invite me to come and eat lamb, marry my daughter, <laughs> be the man of our community. This is literally. This is reality. Literally. So this person, if, he's, if he does have a pure heart, if Allah hasn't purified him, do you think he's going to relinquish this power yes. to somebody that's younger than him, smarter than him, more talented than him, an actual real student of knowledge that's up at night reading and studying books as Ali David says, principles, rules, usul of fiqh, he says, judicial law, not sharia. Me, I barely graduated. I barely study. I barely speak Arabic. It's just like sports. They're the greats of the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s. It's nothing like the athleticism of 2017. It's nothing like this player who can play the power forwards, the small forward, the shooting guard, punk. he can play every position on the court. The athleticism is nothing how it was back then. A 50 yard field goal was an accomplishment. Now people kicking 60, 65 yard field goals easily. The athleticism has evolved. So it's a different breed of student of knowledge. Now people are getting PhDs. People are getting masters where people are studying and benefiting. So what you did back in the day, perhaps it was good, it was sufficient. You did what you could. And the only knowledge back in the day was getting the phone and call a shake. How did he lie? But it's a new day. A new sheriff is in town. Don't be the hero too long that you see yourself to become the villain. No doubt. So Learn when to bow out so and pass the torch so on to someone The point else. is, the point is, Absolutely. is that if these, if these people don't, if they're not purified by law, they don't want to relinquish their power. So Abu Sam was a better speaker than me. He actually graduated. I just lived in Kuwait and I was an English teacher. He actually graduated, he has a degree. He can translate, he can give a lecture, he can give a khutbah, he can do all these marriage counseling. I don't want that Musama to take my position and my status. He's better than me, he looks better than me, he's cooler than me. I have to get rid of that Musama. This is a reality. So how can I get rid of him? I can't beat him in a fist fight. <laughs> Preach. <laughs> can't beat him in a fist fight. <laughs> What am I gonna do? I'm gonna do what now? I'm gonna find a way to assassinate his character. Get rid of him. He said this, he did this, what I cut, what I paste, he didn't mean it, he explained it. However, I get rid of it, that's what I'm gonna do. When I call up the chef, yeah, chef, listen carefully. We have someone, not a graduate, not an imam of a community, not a leader, not someone that took this hole in the wall, matched it, and turned it into a major center. But we have someone who's called you die, you some man, some medjool, ignorant guy, some nobody. We have someone who says this, who says kada, who says kada, who says kada. He's a Shia when it comes to the Sahaba. He's a Qadri when it comes to the predestiny. He's a Murjik when it comes to Iman, when it comes to the rulers. He's a Khawarij. Every bid'ah is in him. <laughs> this is real That is real talk. So the scholar, like we said, the accountability. He's either going to give a general answer, I don't know who this person is. If what you're saying is true, then that's wrong, so on and so forth, stay away from him. Who is the person? Allah Allah, what the scholars want to say. The point is, is that there are many reasons, there are many causes, from them is people being afraid, people being inferior, people being jealous, and people being envious. They mention here about being on a pedestal and you never thought, that wasn't how I came up. People always envied me. I wasn't a deviant back then, but it was always tension because I was so young. And the brothers that would shake my hand, we would sit, drink tea together, and people that would talk about me behind my back. So the point is, is that in 2002, and I'm going to leave you with this, I was sitting in the Prophet's Masjid with Sheikh Abdul Muslim and Abed. And they asked him a question, and perhaps the name of the person most of us can't even pronounce. They said, Yeah, Sheikh. Sheikh Abdul Muslim Abed is the grandfather of, of Medina. He's the teacher of all the scholars of Medina. Sheikh Rabi himself studied with him for two years. They asked Sheikh Abdul Hassan. This is 2002 now. Yeah, Sheikh, what about the tabdir of Abu Hassan al-Halabi, uh, Abu Hassan al-Ma'rabi, so on and so forth. 
The Sheikh didn't say Sheikh Rabi is right, Sheikh Rabi is this, Sheikh Rabi is a great thing. He didn't say any of that. He says all of these issues are based off of, he says, Ahwaf and Nufus. He says, personal beefs and grievances. Now, you're shaking your head and saying, nah, man. In 2002, I wasn't. You wouldn't have agreed with that at all. I didn't disrespect the Sheikh. I'm like, dang, how you gonna say that, Sheikh? That is all personal. That is all personal. 15 years later, only Allah knows what became clear, what became manifest. Their brothers in the crowd, you can ask, that saw the gradual development, and those words were as clear as day. And the same thing has happened and is happening in America. The only reason why you were looking for the mistakes of Shadid, if he did make a mistake, maybe he did make a mistake, maybe. The only reason why you were looking for them is because you're jealous. The only reason why you're looking to find what Abu Osama said is because you're insecure and inferior. You're afraid Abu Osama is better than you and he's going to take your power and your authority. And then comes the game, so on and so forth. So this is in brief. This is in brief. This is not everything. <laughs> the most important thing that I want to give you guys is just look at what happened. Abu Osama mentioned about the scholars from Jordan. Abu Osama, Ali Halabi, Musa Nasser, Hussein Aisha. Osama Kusi from Egypt, QSS, they came to America, came to America, came to Canada. What happened to those scholars? They became deviants. But Al Phillips, this one, that one, burn his books, get rid of his tapes. You accepted Islam, you made Tarabiyah, you grew your beard, you put on hijab, you left Kufr, you left Shirk, you came to the deen, now get rid of all of his books. And then another scholar comes, he's a deviant now. And then this one comes from Bahrain, and this one, and this one, and that one. How long are you going to be stupid? How long are you going to see that it's a big game and it's a big joke? And you're the victim of it. You're on the, the, the shortest end of the stick. You can't build, you can't make nothing consistent upon someone teaching you, benefiting your soul, and then burn all of his books. So you're held accountable as well. That's in brief. Allah Allah. Allahu Akbar. Take me up. Allah to what if we didn't say anything else tonight, you have cut kufitu, you have been sufficed. Abu Sam, you wanted to say something? Okay. All right, so we'll make this my, my last question. I, I, and like, you guys, you get it now? Is it clear to you now? Is it clear? I'm, I'm hoping that it's clear. This is the, the benefit of asking questions. Asking questions is actually a form of teaching, right? And the Hadith of Jibreel, who was the teacher? The Prophet or Jibreel? Jibreel. Jibreel. And Jibreel never gave anything more than a question. The Prophet told Umar, Atadri min as Do you know who the questioner was? Umar said, Wallahu wa Rasuluhu a'lam. Allah and his messenger knows best. He said, Hadha Jibreel atakum yu'allimukum umur adinikum. That was Jibreel who came to teach you your religion. Jibreel never said anything except to ask a question. أخبرني عن الإسلام أخبرني عن الإيمان وأخبرني عن الإحسان. Tell me about Islam, tell me about Iman, and tell me about Ihsan. And because of that, the Prophet وسلم, called Jibreel the teacher. So what we are doing right now, class is in session. Make no mistake about that. My last question, um, there's actually two more. Hopefully we can get through this, inshallah. What should... Um, Islamic communities expect from students a knowledge upon their graduation and repatriation, which means to return back to their country of origin. Um, and how have the previous expectations, if there were any at all, of graduating students, have they been too low, such that many have come home and not contributed much to, with respect to changing the condition of our communities? So what should the expectation of Islamic communities be regarding students of knowledge who graduate and repatriate back to their communities? What should be our expectation? What should we expect from students of knowledge who return home? Should they grab a book or Surah Thadatha and start saying, well, the Sheikh is saying here, well, the Sheikh is saying here, and what the Sheikh is, means here, is that what a student of knowledge should be doing? Because many of us don't know what our expectations of graduates, of students and knowledge should be. So we allow them to come home, come back into the communities, and they grab a small metin, they grab a small you know, text, and they, off they go teaching, and we say, oh, we got a student and knowledge in our community, and his presence is no different than his absence. 
وجوده كعدمه His presence is no more beneficial than his absence. That's the question, inshallah, Ta'ala. His brother is trying to get your attention for a long time. Uh, he has to change. You got to change the... Go ahead. We ran our 80, 80 minutes. So we're on our second set of 80 minutes. No, alhamdulillah. Imam Ahmed, rahimahullah Ta'ala, said that when Abu Zara used to pass through Khurasan, Kunna Natajannab Qiyamul Layl. He said when Abu Zura'a, the great scholar, would pass through Khurasan, through the area of Iraq, we wouldn't even pray to Hajju, because we would benefit from him for the time that he was with us. Amen. So if you have regular plans for the night, you're here for the rest of the night. <laughs> Abu Zura'a is here. Um, so that's the question of Shalom Tada, and I'll leave it to um, the imams and students to answer that. Uh, let me begin by saying that um, I see a lot of people in the crowd when I came in who were older, some older than me, alhamdulillah. And uh, based upon what my uh, beloved brother Mufti mentioned about uh, the people of 2017 being a different breed, that is true. The Sunnah of the Prophet is that there always has to be this process of passing off the baton. It has to be. If you don't have that in your community, there's a problem. And everybody has it. We are the few people, we're probably the only species of people, we don't have that thing of even respecting our elders. We have disrespect for elders. So when Bilal Phillips was on the scene, he was like my elder, and Bilal Phillips was refuting the Ansar Law cult. He was writing, he was a prolific writer. I had that book, Kitab al Tawheed, things that he did, and he was spreading the Sunnah. He was spreading the Sunnah, but yet he turned into something that uh, was unfair and unjust. I say that to say a lot of these brothers and other of these brothers, even some from the other side, uh, one thing that I always tried to do was to give these brothers love, always, always. I remember there was some drama and some beef between one of the famous imams in East Orange, New Jersey, Abu Muslima. He had some problems with a couple of brothers back then, before it really got intense. I would give a lecture in East Orange, New Jersey, and in front of the people, I would say, so-and-so is a good student. You brothers should try to be like so-and-so and so-and-so. I didn't know Mufti that well. I knew this one brother on the other side. And I used to say that because I wasn't afraid of the ramifications of that. And I wanted to always be a person who was trying to get along with the brothers. And I didn't think that all the drama was warranted. But it became what it has become. But I'm happy to say once again, from the name of Allah, I never was one of those people who had like this thing about the up and coming brothers or something to be feared. Because it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense. Which brings us right into this issue of what should we expect from people who graduate in the du'at and all of that kind of stuff. And a lot of stuff can be said about that, but I think we have to be realistic first and foremost. We have to be realistic. We have to be realistic and understanding that Everybody is not a speaker. Even from the ulama, a Shaykh ibn Uthaymin, rahmatullahi alayhi, he wasn't the best orator. His classes were beneficial. But when he gave a khutbah, he wasn't the type of person who, for me personally, would inspire me like people who were lesser than him in degrees because that wasn't his forte in terms of inspiring me anyway. So not everybody is going to be a khatib, not everybody is going to be a speaker. He may be a researcher, the other one may be doing something that uh, is going to be more in line with his skill set. And that's an ayat of the Qur'an. Everybody has his path that he's been put on. So follow your path. Follow your path. So this brother, he has the Magdiya show. This brother over here, he's doing whatever he's doing. 
You're the Evan. You're the cat who always is fasting on Mondays and Thursdays. You're the elder dude of the community, and you over there, you the security and on and on. Just get in where you fit in and do your thing. So to think that every student that comes back, he's qualified or competent to even be an imam, that's not true. I knew students. I knew students from America. They got caught smoking weed in Medina. Dude came back and he was smoking weed in Medina from Chicago. He got kicked out. That's not for you no, now to go back. That's not for you to go and look for who was studying Medina from Chicago. <laughs> no, but I know worse than that. I know some of the students who didn't get up for Salat. They didn't get up for Fajr. I knew people like that. They didn't get up for Salat and Fajr. So my point is, to be unrealistic and to think that everyone who graduates, that is a stamp that this person is qualified to give fatwas, qualified to, no. You have to look and identify what are the reality, what's the reality of the person's skill set. Another issue in terms of the reality of the situation and knowing where everybody, uh, what his job is and, and, and where we fit in, uh, this thing is a double-edged sword. Because on one hand, having the job as the imam or an imam, some of the PM panels said that the imam is underpaid and he's overworked. Underpaid and he's overworked. And that's a reality for some people. And before I forget, because this just came to my mind, because someone said it, I think we have to, we have, we have to uh, pay homage right now. Some of you were laughing with loud voices. And I'm thinking, is this appropriate or not appropriate? Because when I came into the room, people were giving me love. And Ali Saba bumped into me like the Negro that he is from Detroit. He bumped into me. And I looked around thinking that some, the other side were here. But he was just joking with me. But when I came in, I realized I was disturbing the Darus of Mufti. I realized that. I was sensitive to that. Because when I'm teaching, I don't want people passing out water like this brother just did. I don't want people eating cookies and stuff. That gets into my central nervous system, and while teaching, I'll go off. Not crazy, but I, because that's from the etiquette. The companions used to sit, and they said, if a bird landed on their shoulder, the bird, they, that, that's how still they were. So the Medjidus, it has and requires a level of edip. So I, I apologize to him for that. I was sensitive to the laughing that was going on. But I said, nah, nah, in the context of what this is all about, this is cool and this is our people, in my opinion, which brought this issue that I gotta bring to the table right now because we'd be remiss if we close this out without saying this. When our brother Abu Abdul Razak Tahi Wyatt um, got accepted to have a chair in the Prophet's mosque, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, I went on record to publicly say, I support that. Not only do I support that, but I said, Tahir is a lesson and an ayat from the ayat of Allah for our children. Like my little nephews who came up to me from Cincinnati, from Ohio. These little, these little shorties that's up in the spot. Tahir White proved to these kids, yo, the sky is the limit by the Lord of the Kaaba, inshallah. So I think we have to go on record publicly saying and acknowledging amongst ourselves, amongst ourselves, that that brother got his PhD and he did very well. He did exceptionally well. But in doing well, he got to be realistic. Does that mean he shared his land when he comes back to this joint? Does it mean that he shared his land? And this thing about loving ourselves, loving ourselves, for someone to conflate being proud to be African American, to someone to conflate that and confuse that with you being racist. You no, know, you could be a racist, but you have to make it clear. I never believed like some of the people preceding us to Islam from Jamaat to Blee, they started speaking, and I'm not bashing you if that's your flex. People from Jamaat Tablik were speaking with a Pakistani accent, brother, brother. And I never believed that I had to do that. I never believed that I had to do that. 
So now that that brother has accomplished what he accomplished, it's a responsibility. Let's take that brother as the apex in terms of the question. We have to figure out, based upon his past, where he's at, where he's going, where he's going to be, whatever community he comes to. Maybe he has to go to a community that unfortunately our reality may be we can't afford that door. Because we've been lunching for 20 years, we can't afford them. But whatever the reality is, he goes to one of them Desi communities, Pakistani brothers or something like that, just so that he could feed his family. I ain't hating him for that. I ain't against that. He gotta take care of his family. But still, we're gonna try to utilize, we're gonna try to utilize that brother to help our situation to the best of our ability, but for us to hate on him because he went there, part of the issue is part of our problem, what has happened all of these last 20 years. So in terms of response, in terms of what's the responsibility, how should we be looking at this situation? I think at the top of the list, we just have to be realistic about the people who go out, go over and study, and coming back, and then see what needs to be done. To look at the person, we have that um, Mahdi Minhaj, the Mahdi and Muntala. We're waiting for the Mahdi to come and solve all of the problems. Because when the Mahdi comes back, all of this drama in the earth, Trump, Iraq, all of this drama, he's going to fill the earth with justice just as it has been filled with all of this oppression. So we're going to wait for the student to come back and he has all the answers. That's crazy. That's insane. That's insanity. He is not physically, mentally, spiritually capable of doing all of that. He has his niche, he's responsible for it. We have to acknowledge that, which brings me to the end of what I have to say in this regard. Thus, the light is shed upon the importance of unity. Unity. And unity is not necessarily us being together like this in one room all again, but it's him doing his job and not conflicting with mine, and him doing his job, and not conflicting with his, because in reality, all of our jobs are the same, but no single man can be on every ship that's leaving the dock. It's impossible, it's impossible. So in closing, uh, Abu Zubair mentioned about this thing about her, um, loving the spotlight and hating and jealousy. You guys were laughing, but it's as real as real gets. It's the culture that we're coming in, the hip-hop culture. And with these millenniums, our kids, it even becomes even more, more stamped in their psyche. I think everybody here heard of Sufyan Athori, one of the ten people considered Amir al-Mu'minin in Hadith. This man is on another level, at his own medhat. He said that the biggest jihad that he had to make was jihad against that thing of people looking at him coming from all over the world to meet this man. And if that's the case with him, if that's the case with him, <laughs> what do you think is the case with people like us? Who sometimes, we didn't always have Tarbiya, we didn't always have that upbringing where, you know, it's going to be a bigger possibility. So it is an issue that is definitely there. So I would say, we just have to be realistic as it relates to people who are coming back. Don't expect too much, what's beyond people's ability, and at the same time, don't think, like in our audience right now, like brothers, we have sisters who are teachers, Islamic teachers, Islamic teachers, getting only a fraction of the salary that non-Muslims are getting for various reasons. Is it realistic to expect a guy, a, mom, a girl, a lady, a man, to work in a school for peanuts, and they have to do all of that jihad of dealing with those kids? This is not, this is, this is not right. So you're basically you're saying that the expectation shouldn't be too high and shouldn't be too It low. should be realistic. Realistic. Just it should be realistic. Okay. Anyone else want to chime in on that? The expectation of the student when he graduates and repatriates back into his community, what should be the expectation of the community? What should we expect of students when they graduate and come back home should there be an expectation? And if so, what should that expectation be? Um, before we get into the expectation of the community, the student knowledge has to realize, and also the layman person, the, the member of the community, without imposing, 
but to realize, and sometimes brothers need reminders. You need a, a friendly reminder, is that before we get into what you owe us, what you have to do for your community, for your people, for your country, you owe the Islamic University of Medina. It's a debt that you have to repay to Umar Qura. Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, wherever you study, they did not give you that scholarship. They did not pay thousands and thousands of dollars for your plane tickets, for your lodging, for your food, for this and for that, for your books, for you to just sit back and enjoy a comfortable, easy going life. That is unfair and that is unrealistic. And if you read the mission statement of the Islamic University of Medina, you'll find this. So first and foremost, the responsibility that you have with regards to your own debt. You graduated from Medina, you have to pay back every single real that was given to you for free. And that real has to be paid back through your service, first and foremost for your own soul, and for your community, your, your, your family, your race, your, your country, whatever the case may be. That's first and foremost. And uh, I think a lot of us, we lose focus of that. Some of us, we lose focus of that one way or another, that I'm indebted to this country and to this school, and I have to pay off this debt. And we all know what the Prophet ﷺ says about debts. The Prophet ﷺ says, يُغْفَرْ لِلشَّهِيدِ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ He says that the martyr will be forgiven for every single sin. He who dies on the battlefield, if he should be to die. Then the Prophet ﷺ, he then said, إِلَّا دَيْنِ سَعْرَنِي بِهِ جِبْرِيلُ وَعَنِفَى he says, except for one's debt, because Jibreel just told me. He just gave me this last piece. Everything is forgiven for the martyr except for a debt. So, Ahi, my fellow companion, my colleague, younger, older, for the aspiring brothers and sisters, if you're unwilling to pay off that debt, don't take the scholarship. As far as the actual question, what should the communities expect? Then, as was mentioned, the expectation shouldn't be but so high. The expectations shouldn't be but so low, but the people should be excited. The people, they should look forward to someone who speaks their language, their tongue, who knows their culture, who eats their foods, who comes from their struggles, who has their social ills. And the Idhan Allah Ta'ala, by Allah's permission, is going to help them out. And is going to teach them and, and, and deal with the children, deal with the problems, the marriage, the divorce, the custody, and everything else. And there are some brothers, friends, and students, they literally, they come to me, or they say, I'm going to take you here, Brother Wilson, when they lock you, say, Mufti, you're a hostage. We want you to tell us this and explain this and give us that. Brothers call, brothers text, brothers what's that? We want you to give what you've learned. It's nothing wrong with that. We're expecting that. It's nothing wrong with that. It's that that's, that's fine. And one should be greedy for knowledge. As the Prophet ﷺ said, Ben Humani la yashba'an. He says there are two greedy people that will never ever be satisfied. Two types of greedy people that will never be satisfied. He said, Ben Humun fi talib al la yashba' wa man humun fi dunya la yashba'. He says, the student of knowledge will never be satisfied. The one who's obsessed with ilm will never be satisfied. And the one who's obsessed with dunya will never ever be satisfied. So you being diligent, you being greedy, you being a little aggressive and grabbing a brother, come on, give us some classes. We want to travel with you. We want to learn with you. Give us a story about Medina. There's nothing wrong with that. But at the same time, before you expect something, what are you offering? And it don't necessarily have to be money. It doesn't necessarily have to be financial things. When you're overseas, and only Allah knows, you may be starving. This is not a joke. This is not to make you laugh. This is a reality. You may be hungry, but on no food in Medina or Yemen. No food. You may be cold at night. You don't want no covers to sleep on. Literally. You may have rats in your apartment. You may be a landlord knocking on the door. Where's the money? And you, shh, be quiet. He's knocking. I know you're in there. It's time to pay the rent. You don't have the rent. You're backed up. You're studying, seeking. This is a reality. Your wife is complaining, taking the kids to the hospital, to the pharmacy. The baby is sick, you don't have the money to pay off the doctor. This is real. You're struggling. So before you expect and demand, what are you offering? It don't necessarily have to be money. Well, a lot of your brothers, they may call you, Salaamu Alaikum, how you doing, Sheikh? We're proud of you. Keep up the good work. Keep studying. Don't worry, the struggle is going to be over soon within that time. That spiritual support, that pushes you a long way. So it don't always have to be money. When somebody comes back, you can support them, help them out. You can accompany them. Do anything that you can to contribute with the Nightala to make his stay as comfortable and welcome as possible with the Night Spana So it's not so much about what you want to take, but it's about what you want to give. Everybody understand this now? The concept of supporting the Imams, supporting the students of knowledge, if you don't, then who will? He's not getting no check from the government. 
He's not getting no stipend. He's no pension. He's not getting no type of proper uh, salary. If you don't look after him, take care of him, protect him, make him feel wanted and welcome and respected, then he's going to go to another community that does provide that. So we have to be, it, it, it's like one hand washes the other. Take two hands to clap. The student knowledge has to realize that he has to pay a cat on his wealth that he has amassed for the last 10 years. And the person, the poor person also has a right as well, and he has a responsibility and a respect as well. So it goes hand in hand. But in general, in brief, the people, they have to make it crystal clear that we love you, we respect you, we honor your accomplishments, and we're waiting for you to get back to teach us our deed. It's their right to expect this. And it's the student of knowledge, it's his right to realize that he has to fulfill the legacy of the scholars that he learned from. You went to the sheikh, you called the sheikh, you bothered the sheikh when he was sitting with his family, and he answered your question. And the same must be done for our people. Well, Allah Allah. Jazakallah khair. Ali, what is, should be the expectation of the community for the student who graduates and comes back to his community? If there should be any expectation at all? And, you know, how should the student fulfill that? And how should the community receive that? It's a complex question. First, I want to ask Allah, allow us all to die without, without our debts being paid. I mean, I mean um, and for, for the community to excuse the students of knowledge and imams, there's many imams in the crowd that I, that I see that are here. Let me just say before I leave, before you continue, forgive us. We're not perfect. I've said some things that were controversial. Mufti Abu Osama in the years that he has been involved in the communities. And unfortunately, sometimes we don't understand the, the, the power of our words or the, how much influence we really have. Sometimes we underestimate our stardom. And we don't realize how much we impact lives of people, sometimes positive, sometimes negative. But you guys have to understand that we're human. Sometimes you elevate us to a level that is haram for you to do. You make it so like we're not even allowed to make mistakes. We're not even allowed to be human. And it's unfair. Because then that means that your expectations of us are unrealistic. It's almost like the Quraysh said about the Prophet, you know, how could he be a Prophet he eats food and he walks in the marketplace. It's like, well, am I not a human being? Am I not supposed to eat food? Am I not supposed to go shopping in the marketplace? It's unrealistic. And Allah retorted with, we have never sent a messenger before. Except, except they used to eat food and walk in the marketplace. The expectations sometimes that you guys have of people such as us in these positions are unrealistic and it's unfair. Sometimes you function with a sense of entitlement as if we owe you. You send a message on a Facebook page, you send a message on a Twitter page, and then when they don't respond, it's like, oh, I sent you a message two days ago, you didn't respond. Well, I didn't know responding to you was a priority in my life. I'm sorry. I didn't know responding to you was a priority in my life. As if I don't have a wife or wives, I don't have children. You know how many children I have? I have 12 children. You understand? Like, you think about that for a minute. If I never responded to anybody's email, I'm justified. Because at least I'm taking care of mine and I don't ever have to worry about, worry about you sending me an email about my kids. Inshallah, bismillah, I, I pray, <laughs> Allahumma. <laughs> but, you know, it's a sense of entitlement and it's not fair. You have sisters, like you don't even, we don't even want to open that door. Sometimes sisters, oh, I want to marry him. But what makes you think I want to marry you? You have a sense of entitlement that you feel like, oh, mashallah, he inspired me. So you want to marry me because I inspired you? Like, really? So every time a man inspires you, you want to marry them? 
I mean, think about the mentality. And then you subject imams, we're human beings. Yusuf alayhi salam, he said to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, wa illa tasrif anni kaydahunna asbu ilayhinna. That if you do not turn the plot of these women away from me, asbu ilayhinna, I might incline, I'm a man. I may incline. Wala akunna min al-jahineen, and then I'll be amongst the ignorant. We're humans. You send a message and you know that it's haram instead of you sitting, oh, I'm just wondering, brother, are you looking for marriage? Stop for a long. And then we begin this conversation and in the moment you realize that I'm interested in somebody else instead of you, then you want to take screenshots of my conversation and then post it on the internet. Oh, he was talking to me and it was haram anyway. But you're exposing yourself because you knew it was haram. And then we'll say, well, he's a student of knowledge. He should know better. Now I'm a human being, and you knew that, and you should know better. You took advantage of my vulnerability. And I'm, you know what I mean? I'm not necessarily a fan of Norman Ali Khan, and pretty much you all are aware of what's happening. But this is exactly what happens. That man was nothing more than a human being. And he was exploited. And people will say, well, he's, he's an imam, he's a student, and he should know better. But then now you're taking the responsibility off yourself because you're saying basically I can do whatever I want to do and because he's a student of knowledge he should obey and live by the rules and laws that he knows. And you put it back on the person without taking any responsibility for yourself. And these are unrealistic expectations. Stop raising students of knowledge to the status of superstardom. We are not superstars. As a matter of fact, we don't even want to be doing what we're doing. I didn't ask for this. Nobody up here asked for this. This was put into our laps. There's some people who are born in greatness, some people who develop greatness, and then there's some people who greatness is just put in their laps, and they got to deal with that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَنَبَلُوكُمْ بِالشَّرِّ وَالْخَيْرِ فِتْنَةً that we will test you with good and evil. Good is a fitna as well. Being a student of knowledge is a fitna. Understand. So your expectations, brothers and sisters, has to be realistic. Stop. Aisha radiallahu anha, she said, We have been commanded to put everyone in their proper place. To give someone a status that does not belong to them is wrong. And the expectation of the student of knowledge should be, as Abu Saba mentioned, should be realistic. So with that being said, inshallah ta'ala, I want uh, Imam Ali to respond, what should the community expect from the student of knowledge upon his graduation, uh, graduation and repatriation into the community? Oh, yeah. <clears throat> it's a good question. Um, first, I think I think people here, everyone needs to understand who these students and knowledge are. Many of us, maybe the brother's not here, but many of the other students and knowledge, when you go overseas and study, you're just nobody among other students and knowledge. In fact, many of us may not have even been the best in our classes from students and knowledge. Uh, even to the point when you sit with the different ulama, you have many other students that are a lot stronger than many of us. Many of us. And when they graduate or when they finish school, you know their level. And see, the thing is, when students of knowledge are around other students of knowledge, you can't fake like you know more than what you know. We all know, it's like if you're a doctor, all the doctors in the field, they know each other's level and they, they know what they're capable of and they know what they're not. The same thing with students of knowledge. You can't play that game in front of other students of knowledge. The problem is, when students of knowledge graduate and come back to America and they start talking to the masses, the masses don't know any better. They're fooled, hoodwinked. And so what happens is the other students, they know the reality. They know that this guy's a fraud. 
or this person he's playing games or he's out for this and out for that. It's clear for the ones that know. So when it comes to setting up, and I just wanted to say that first, when it comes to setting up expectations for the students when they return, the first thing is that in our communities, we don't have any real infrastructure set up in place to support students and knowledge when they come back. That's just the reality at the end of the day. And so what happens is there's no protocol in place that prepares us to come back to America. In fact, I remember when Shadid graduated. He was 07, right? In 2007. 2006, we all still in school. He's still in school, I'm still in school. But he graduated in 07. What are you gonna do when you get back? Nobody knows. There's nothing in place, nothing. So that was in 07. I graduated in 2014. What do you, what's in place? Nothing. So when you come back, you're scrambling. Well, what am I going to do? I'm going to go here, I'm going to go there, I'm going to go there. Sheikh Abu Sam, he came way before you graduated, in the 90s. The 90s. I wasn't even Muslim when he graduated. <laughs> the thing about it is, there's nothing in place. So the expectations of the students is to come back and save the day, but they don't have any tools to save the day with because there's no infrastructure. There's nothing in place to support them. And we're not necessarily talking about money and so on and so forth. Just whatever the case may be, there's nothing in place. So when a student comes back, he has to start from ground zero. Firstly, how are you going to take care of your family? That's first and foremost. You can't help a community if you can't help yourself. Now you, want, now you have to figure that out. Then that's going to take a whole nother year and some change as soon as you come back. Then once you start having some run, everyone's pulling at you. Brother, we need you to come here. Well, I got right there. I gotta figure out how, so now the expectations of the student is a lot more than, they, than they're able to fulfill. Then not to mention the tons of phone calls. I have a phone with hundreds of missed calls and people think I'm slighting them. It's not personal, I just don't have the time. It's only 24 hours in a day. It's only, and then your family has your time, and then, they, then you don't even spend enough time with your children. So then they feel some type of way. So this is the reality. Now. What should be the real life expectation? The expectation is that you should expect from a student the knowledge to be sincere in dealing with you. That's the real expectation. The expectation is that that student of knowledge has a trust and a, a manner that they must convey. You should, you, your expectation should be that they should be honest with you at all times, even if it harms them. That's a real fair expectation, that they're gonna give you the truth. And, they, and you should also expect that whatever comes out of their mind, their mouths, they have to stand in front of a law with it. So if they tell you something that's incorrect, they have to wear that. And it's also for the student the knowledge to fear a law. When you talk to the people, you must, and all of us, we must fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when we say whatever comes out of our mouths. And having said that, our expectation from the people is to give us time to grow. Because being back here in America and dealing with our problems that we face every day, we may not be ready to deal with all of that coming straight off the plane. And I remember Shadid and I had conversations over the years, and he knows this. When I was in school, and he would be dealing with the problems that he's dealing with. He says, Ali, you gotta, I said, Shake, I'm not ready yet. I'm just not there yet. It takes time. I'm not ready to speak on those issues that you're speaking on. I need more time to develop in this environment. Um, other brothers had other years to develop. Everyone develops at their own pace. No one's going to move on someone else's time. So at the end of the day, everyone has to give the students of knowledge the ability to grow in their community. You have to understand, we may have spent 10 years in a foreign society learning a foreign culture that's foreign to us living in it, experiencing it, dealing with people according to it. Now I gotta come back to Philly. When I first became the Imam at the Masjid in South Philly, I actually did, I said, listen man, we gotta deal with these marriage and divorce issues. And you, I, don't, you, I, don't, I don't think you remember this. I said, I gotta deal with the issues of marriage and divorce. So he said, well, what do you wanna do if a woman, you know, she wants a khula and the brother's not, I'm just gonna have to separate them. He said, man, you gonna get yourself killed. <laughs> I said, what do you mean? Remember that? He said, I said, what do you mean? We get to the sunnah. No, man. You got to understand the society we live in. A brother's not going for that. 
So it's like all of these things, everything is not kitab, shunna, black and white, the way we studied it. We have to understand our people. We have to understand how they react. So this is a learning process. This doesn't happen overnight. So as many times I went, oh, how do you deal with this? The rule says this. Well, that you got to bend it this way and that way to make it fit. All right, I said, okay. This is something that students have to learn. You don't just come back overseas living in a foreign country for 10 years and understand that process right away. It doesn't work that way. So having said that, you know, that's my two cents to the whole conversation, and I'm gonna let you take the microphone. So the the no, no, fair, fair, fair enough, man. Uh, Abu Sama, inshallah ta'ala, is going to make a closing remark, and then inshallah ta'ala, I'll give uh, each of the um, scholars that are sitting with me, inshallah, um, just one minute to leave you guys with some final information for the night, inshallah. I'm happy that uh, Ali had mentioned some of the responsibilities that the student of knowledge has towards the community in terms of sincerity and things like that because it wouldn't be correct, it wouldn't be responsible, it wouldn't be Islamic to put all the blame and the onus of stepping up to the plate on the community. So he made that pretty clear. I just want to add one issue for the students of knowledge to our, uh, ponder over because it's serious and that is that our community uh, they have the right that the students of knowledge who have graduated, who are sitting here, and other than that, that we do a better job with uh, communicating with each other and networking with each other. Uh, we're to blame, like my man right here, um, Shadid. He always calls me old head when he, when he writes to me. I mean, it's crazy massive disrespectful, but he's always calling me. Your old head, your old head, stuff like that. And that's because he's my little brother. So when this thing happened recently, when this thing happened recently, I have to have the nerve, the gall, I have to have the love to be able to step to him and give him my point of view and what I think you should be doing and you shouldn't be doing. And that has some reciprocity in it as well, that he has to do the same for me and that's how we do it. There are situations that are going on in our community where ignorance is perpetuated and it's stuff that will blow your mind that this imam is acting this way or that one is acting that way and nothing is happening. And part of that problem is because we don't come together collectively to step to the person and say, hey, what are you doing? And I end with this example when I was in the UK. Our sister, I don't want you, you know, let's just be big about it. Our sister um, was about to go and participate in the Olympics doing fencing recently, in this last Olympic. And some of the people supported that. When people called me overseas in the UK and they said, what do you think about that? I said, look, as far as my daughter is concerned, uh, I want my daughter no fencing, and I want my daughter to be able to defend herself. But getting in front of the world and fencing, I ain't gonna do that because I love for my brother and I love for myself, so I wouldn't do it. But I would never condemn, never condemn publicly anybody who tried to help to get money for that. Because they got their point of view and they got the reasons that are motivating them to do that. So instead of us, being people who are condemning without any communication, without any discussion, but this ain't the way to do it. So I say to every student of knowledge with this last issue, did you reach out to this man to say to him, I'm not happy with what you said, and I'm not happy with what you dealt with. And then he has that personality, and it's not about him, I'm gonna say it straight up, because I'm the old head up in the spot. He has that personality where we come from, the cloth that we're cut from is, hey man, don't step on my shoes. Don't push me around. Don't push me around. And this is one of the things I couldn't understand about drinking that Kool-Aid, man. I don't care how much knowledge a dude has. I know game from Jahiliya. You ain't coming up in here pushing me around like that. So three people didn't get knocked off the square. One, he never was a yes man, never. So you ain't pushing me to take you. You ain't bullying me. 
The second one is the guy who experienced himself or herself the oppression of that stuff. Now you know it up close and personal. And number three, the one who just has knowledge and he says, this is crazy what you people are talking about. It's crazy. So my point is, students of knowledge, are we networking in a way where we're helping the problem or because everybody is busy, everybody is busy. But that being busy is at the expense of, at the expense of the community. And the community, they have a hock upon us that we do a better job. So us coming here now for this thing right now is one of the steps that we're trying to make where we can sit down and we have some serious discussions about some issues that are on the table. And a lot is our tofit is only with him. Um, can I get a raise, uh, a hand raise for the imams that are in the building? Imams, any imams here? One, two. Imam Tariq, come on man, put your hand up, Shake. All right, so we have, you have some imams in the building, all right? Um, and why I'm pulling them out or asking them to raise their hands is not necessarily to put them on the spot, but we want to acknowledge them. These are imams of our communities. They don't necessarily have to be the student of knowledge on this level. Nonetheless, they have a position in the community of responsibility, and we should acknowledge that. We are, that's another thing, we are very stingy in our communities with acknowledging the leadership in our community.